at me and tell me what you see I look at you and tell you what I feel Look at me and tell me what you see I look at you and tell you what I feel It's the last movie for HP Lovecraft Month and I got something a little bit different as it's not an adaption of a Lovecraft story but a John Carpenter film in his Apocalypse Trilogy but before we get to that, welcome back to HP Lovecraft Month. Today we'll be looking at In the Mouth of Madness, a film so heavily inspired by the Lovecraft stories with references throughout, I simply couldn't ignore it. And In the Mouth of Madness title is a direct reference to the story at the Mountains of Madness. The movie starts by kicking it into high gear with images of books being made and the most kick-ass soundtrack playing. We start in Media Res, at that stalwart of Lovecraft, ending where we began in From Beyond, at the Mental Asylum, as they get a new patient. It's our main character, Sam Neill's John Trent, who I think would rather not be there. Yep, definitely doesn't want to be there. Trent is put in his cell as he desperately tries to tell them he's not insane. And to make things worse, he's subjected to the worst kind of torture. Not the carpenters too. And I don't think it's mere coincidence that this song is We've Only Just Begun. It's pretty damn ominous to say the least. The music suddenly stops and the lights dim. Trent knows what's about to happen as a hand knocks the window of his cell. And as he goes to see what it was, a dark figure appears behind him. Trent says this is a rotten way to end things, but the figure says it doesn't end since he's not read it yet. As the window smashes and Trent gets horrible visions. <laughs> Very muted and confusing opening so far, but the confusion is to be expected because we're in media res and we've not got the beginning of the story yet. It works well because firstly, we're not sure if Trent really is just insane, and secondly, we start to feel like he does, perfectly setting up the mood of the film. And it makes a change to the other movies this month, where it was quickly established what the horror was, so it's much more of a building of suspense. Shortly after Trent's incident, he gets a visitor in the form of David Warner, who tells the Doctor they've been monitoring all channels, and the Doctor asks if he thinks Trent's one of them, saying things must be getting pretty bad if his organisation is on the case. And considering we never find out who or what David Warner's working for, it adds to the dread and unease around Trent's character. The Doctor lets the guy in, saying that Trent's only request was for a black crayon, and in the cell he can see Trent's gotten a hell of a lot of use out of it which means he really is crazy, or just damn good at making it look that way. The guy says he's there to help him out of the asylum, but Trent insists he likes it there now, with the guy admitting the crosses almost guarantee him staying there, implying, like I said, that it was a deliberate effort. Which further reinforces the fact that something, we don't know what, is loose on the world. It's pretty clear that this film is a lot more psychological in nature, because we've only got our imagination to go on, and as the film fills in those blanks, it'll be using our imagination to build upon. Trent and the guy start talking, with Trent asking if he wants to hear about his them. My them. Not every paranoid schizophrenic has one, a them, a they, and it. You want to hear about my them? 
Gotcha. Trent says that he knows things are bad outside, but he begins his story regardless, mentioning it started with the Sutter Kane disappearance, as we begin the flashback. Trent worked as an insurance investigator sniffing out fraudsters, and he was very good at it, as we see him sweat a guy for a few minutes, making him think he's gotten away with his fraud, until he just reveals he spoke to his wife, who didn't take kindly to knowing the guy had a mistress, blowing the scam. Instantly we get this image of Trent as this logical, very clever man who's always looking for the con and can instantly see it. A sharp contrast to Trent before and after the film's events, ramping up the suspense of what's to come. But before that, Trent gets coffee with the guy he was working with and he talks about his method of knowing a con when he sees one, using the phrase, no one pulls his strings, making it far more perplexing considering we know where he ends up. However, as they talk, a dishevelled man appears outside wielding an axe, making his way to where Trent's having coffee. The man gets to the window and as soon as Trent is told about Sutter Kane's disappearance, the man smashes the window. He approaches Trent to ask him something. <laughs> Sutter Kane. What? But the man is luckily shot by police officers. It seems very movie-like and convenient for the guy to smash the window just as Trent is told about Kane, but as we'll see, that was probably the point. Also, take note of the man's eyes. It was strange that they had four pupils, but they were also blue. That'll be important later. That night, Trent is at home recovering as he hears how Kane's novels seem to be causing his readers to become hysterical and violent. It's adding up to the mystery of what's going on, being rather teasingly brief on details. The next day, Trent is at Kane's publisher to go over the investigation and speaks with the guy in charge, Harglow, as he quickly clears the room so they can talk. Kane's editor, Linda Stiles, also enters the room and they start talking about the case, with Stiles particularly surprised when Trent says he's never heard of Kane, with her saying he's the most widely published author, even more so than the likes of Stephen King, who's mentioned because Kane is essentially based on him. Hargelow explains that Kane disappeared two months ago, and the last person to have any contact with Kane was his agent, who's not really in a position to talk right now. I understand you were there when the poor man went crazy in midtown Manhattan. You witnessed the shooting, I believe. That lunatic with the axe? That was Kane's agent? Hard to believe, isn't it? As an agent, he really goes out of his way to publicise his clients. The only downside is he can only do it once. One thing this film does beautifully is that it takes its time. It starts out as a mystery and then turns into a horror film, adding weird things here and there, so we're just as interested as Trent is to get to the bottom of it. For now, a cynical Trent talks with Stiles, saying the agent going crazy and the story of Kane's disappearance is a great publicity stunt to sell books, convinced he's sussed out the con already, mocking Kane's books as he leaves. On his way home, Trent goes through a really dodgy alleyway looking at a Sutter Kane book poster, The Hobbs End Horror, which is a clear reference to the Lovecraft story, The Dunwich Horror. And while there, Trent hears a struggle and looking down the alleyway, he sees a cop beating up a graffiti artist. You want some too, buddy? That's possibly the most random moment of the entire film, mainly because nothing weird has happened yet, so that could be the tipping point into madness the title suggests. And as we'll see, that incident did more to Trent than even he realises. The next day, Trent goes to a bookstore to research Kane's work, with the place quite wrecked because of people going mental. And then there's this guy. I can see. Excuse me? He sees you. Right, uh, tell him I say hi. It's not clear what that means, however, a form of explanation will be revealed later. Trent is back home reading the books, getting startled by a call. He says the books are standard horror fare, but as he continues reading, we see how he's affected, as Trent is now back in the alley. But it's slightly different, like the graffiti now reads I can see, and the cop is now a zombie-like cop. Trent snaps out of it, but then bizarrely it continues, with a group of people gathering behind Trent, with Kane's agent telling him again that he sees him, before the guy is hacked to bits by the mob. And as the cop attacks, Trent wakes up. Huh? 
at least he thought so. Yeah, bit of a dream sequence fake out for you there. But it was masterfully done, so I can't knock it really. But this is what I meant when I said that the incident with the cop was like some kind of catalyst. Because everything weird we've seen revolved around that in some way. Serving as a sign to say, yeah, shit's gonna get weird from now on. Trent's making notes on Kane while getting ink on his face as he does, trying to figure out where Kane disappeared to. However, that's when he sees something strange about the book covers. Ah, you see, with ink on his eyes, Trent can see the pen strokes and through the fourth wall to find answers where he normally wouldn't notice. Yeah, it's bollocks, but it's convincing bollocks, isn't it? Trent tears the book covers off, making book lovers cringe. That's the second time something like that's happened in this show. And Trent starts cutting out the red outlines on the cover, putting them together like a jigsaw puzzle. And back with Harglow, he reveals that they make up a map to Hobbs End, somewhere in New England, which is a reference to Stephen King and his love of the region. Despite his reservations that it's a publicity stunt, Trent drives to find Hobbs End with Stiles, who's asleep in the passenger seat. And then things get inexplicably goofy, as Trent decides to wake Stiles up. Hey, get awake. Hey, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. You're shaking, you asshole. What did I do? What did I do? What did I do? I guess he just wanted to add his own randomness to the mix. Never, never, never throw chips at a driver. That night, Trent asks if Styles enjoys working on Kane's books, and she in turn asks if he enjoys busting people. He says he loves it, telling her how he's bust people he knows, not compromising his job for anyone, saying that people should just be gone and off the planet. I can't find myself disagreeing with that attitude. Which leads to Styles saying he sounds like Kane, and wondering what would happen if reality shared his point of view. A reality is just what we tell each other it is. Sane and insane could easily switch places if the insane were to become the majority. You would find yourself locked in a padded cell, wondering what happened to the world. How oddly prophetic of her there. Later in the night, Styles is now driving while Trent sleeps, and as she does, she passes a distraught looking boy cycling past. Nothing weird about that, surely, apart from it being the dead of night. However, as Styles drives on, another cyclist appears coming towards her, and it looks to be an old man, but on the same bike as the kid, shocking Styles. But she disregards it. But as she checks the map, the old man runs headfirst into the car. Styles stops the car immediately to see if the guy's dead or not. Is he alive? I don't know. Just don't move, you'll get a blanket. Lie still. I can't get out. Don't move. You won't let me out. It's pretty obvious that the kid we saw is this old man and he's been trapped in a constant loop, unable to leave. But why does he have the voice of a child? It gets across what happened to him, but it really doesn't make much sense and just makes it pretty obvious that it's a kid in old man makeup. It's a minor issue, but in a film like this where everything is well done, it's quite the misstep really. And despite being run over, the guy just gets back on the bike and rides away like nothing happened. However, Styles is pretty freaked out. So after the weirdness, Styles is back to driving, but it's not her night, as the lines on the road suddenly disappear, and looking out the window... Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads. No, they're not in a DeLorean, as the car suddenly reaches the road and things get difficult to see, with lights flashing everywhere, but then a tunnel appears, and driving out the other end, Styles finds it's daylight and they've somehow luckily, or unluckily, you decide, managed to find Hobbs End. I love how there's nothing normal about Hobbs End. With that kind of entrance, you really can't be lulled into a false sense of security when that's the first thing you encounter. But also, the name Hob is an old English word for the devil. So I'm really glad they didn't update that name, because Devil's End has horrible connotations to it. But you know, Hob also means a male ferret, so it might not be that bad. They drive through the centre of town, getting out to look around, but the place seems completely deserted, and very quiet. Maybe this place is twinned with Imboka. There is a dog, however, that's being chased by a load of children. Nothing sinister there, until a bloody axe comes into view, making me doubt that first assumption. 
They decide to go to a hotel, finding the Pikmin Hotel, referring to another Lovecraft story, Pikmin's Model, and an apt one for this film, as it looks at the condition of the mind and art. Stiles tells Trent she knew to come to this hotel after reading Kane's novel, Hobbs End Horror. Inside, there are even more similarities, like the painting in the lobby with a loose board in front of it. Mrs. Pickman appears to take their booking, and she's surprised when Trent mentions the town is famous, not knowing who Sutter Kane is. And for some added weirdness, while Trent deals with her, Stiles gets freaked out by the painting that seems to move. I find it interesting that Sutter Kane is so prevalent and so well known that everyone Trent has encountered knows who he is and what he does. However, now, Mrs. Pickman has no idea who he is, and neither had Trent. Certainly raises a few questions. In the room, which is room 9, the same number as Trent's cell, so nice touch there, Trent doesn't really believe what Stiles experienced, saying they're not in a Sutter Kane story. The Mrs. Pickman in the book is a lunatic who chops her husband into coleslaw. Thanks for that heads up, Trent. That'll be a treat for later. Trent tries to prove the book isn't real by showing Stiles that the view from the hotel in the book should be a big church, but it's actually an old barn. But Stiles is quick to point out he's looking in the wrong direction, and they see the massive imposing church, which looks to make Trent reconsider his position just slightly. They decide to investigate the church as Trent reads a passage about it from the book. Originally there was an old stone church built on this site in 1788, but the black church swallowed up the old sanctuary the way it has swallowed our minds. Now there is nothing left of what was once here, except the mosaic of our Lord and Saviour above the front door. Which is actually a line verbatim from the Lovecraft story Haunter in the Dark. While seeing if the place is open, they quickly need to leave, as a large mob of people with guns show up. You remember the traditional Imboka greeting? <laughs> Hobbs End just has its own version, with more guns. Actually, they head for the church, with one of the guys shouting, Give him back. And we see the man's son appear in the doorway. But as the doors open and close, Sutter Kane himself appears in the boy's place, and he sends in the hounds to get the mob to clear off as the dogs attack them. It's safe to say that Sutter Kane isn't a good guy. Back at the room, Trent's pretty angry, just wanting Stiles to admit this whole thing has been staged for his benefit. She insists that he's wrong because he's right. Originally, it was a publicity stunt, but Kane never showed up for it, and they weren't supposed to find anything when Harglow sent them to find Kane. Which makes me wonder just how much of this stuff was a publicity stunt. Because you'd think Kane's agent being shot dead might have been a tip-off that things weren't going to plan and they needed to rethink their marketing strategy just a little bit. And Styles knows that the new book is about the end to everything. But she's only read a few chapters so they need to read it to find out what happens. But forget about that for a second, as for some bizarre reason not explained, Styles kisses Trent. I'd complain about this love interest thing coming out of nowhere, but I think that's the point. Trent inspects the painting, which looks different again, and Mrs. Pickman appears to tell him to stop smoking, and she's acting a little weirder than usual. It's beautiful, isn't it? Sure is. Styles told me you painted it yourself. Styles? Oh, the... You mean the pretty young thing you came in here with? I don't know her at all. Does she know me? Well, she claims she does. So you're not responsible for this? Hell no. That's simultaneously the strangest and funniest response I've ever heard. Trent hears something below the desk, but he's distracted when Stiles runs off with his car. And back with Mrs. Pickman. Oh. Hush. Oh. Wow. She's surprisingly kinky for an old lady. Trent, unsure of what to do, goes into town having a beer at the local bar. One of the guys from the church comes in and he starts talking about Kane and something from the church affecting the town, telling Trent to get out. But he still thinks it's fake and wants the guy to admit he's an actor. Some people might say that Trent is being unrealistic and still assuming it's all a stunt, but it seems realistic to me, because if this was reality, real reality, not movie reality, then any sane, logical person, regardless of what they see, be it a crazy person or some kind of slimy monster, would be constantly thinking it's fake, because those things don't exist. It's like in a zombie movie, when somebody sees a zombie, they assume it's a dead person back to life, rather than the more realistic, it's just someone messing about. 
Meanwhile, Stiles, who's convinced of the weird thing she's seeing, has gone to the church to find Kane, when she's approached by some horrible little monsters. Where do you live? With you. Who takes care of you? You do. You're my mommy. Know what today is? Today is mommy's day. Ugh! Those horrible little monsters have actually become horrible little monsters. Stiles starts searching the church with its upside down crosses for that added touch of cliche for you. She finds an empty room with Kane's typewriter, but walking away she suddenly hears typing, and the room has changed with Kane typing away. <laughs> Thanks for the jump scare there. Styles and Kane start talking, and he's really, really weird saying they were telling him what to write, talking about the bulging and oozing door. Styles is acting pretty weird herself now, almost in a trance. Kane grabs her hair and forces her to read the book, as she gets horrible visions, and coming out of it, her eyes are now bleeding. Insert joke about horrible books here. Twilight, Fifty Shades of Grey, they all work. That's one hell of a growth you've got there, Kane. Might want to get some cream for that. Back with Trent in the room, he's restless, unsure of what to do, when suddenly Styles comes in babbling like a lunatic about losing herself, and telling Trent not to read the book before passing out. Styles' comment of losing herself, to me anyway, could mean that now that she's read the book, she's no longer in control of her own actions, and she's whoever Sutter Kane wants her to be. Now, my first impression of that was, if Sutter Kane can instantly control people, why doesn't he just do it? but he's writing it in the form of a story, so it's almost like a magic spell, and the story itself is the ritual. Trent goes downstairs to get help, trying to find Mrs Pickman, but she's not at the desk, and now the painting has changed horribly, with the church in the background and weird creatures in place of the people. The painting could be a reflection of the town itself, because the place has gotten weirder and weirder the longer we've been there, just like the painting, except it doesn't bother to try and keep itself hidden, it's just full-on cosmic horror. And speaking of weird creatures, Trent goes into the basement to find Mrs. Pickman, but instead, finds that. Really good effects. But I also like that Trent doesn't try to fight it or anything. The monster's just there, and there's no heroics from Trent, because he's just a man. Trent gets back to the room, but something's amiss with Styles. To say the least. And then she throws Trent through the door. Running outside, there's a weird monster in the conservatory, and getting into town, the townspeople are dancing around Styles singing. But naturally, Trent does the best thing in this situation to counteract all this weirdness. He goes to the bar. The guy who was there before is still there, and then there's a strange bit of dialogue. The thing I can't remember is what came first. Us or the book. We are not living in a Sutter Kane story. This is not reality. What did he say? This is not reality. Is it just me, or is that not quite right sounding? Every time Trent has talked about the book and what reality is, he said... This is reality. You hear that? So those choice of words, which at a glance you wouldn't really notice, but it's almost like a subliminal suggestion saying that things really aren't quite right, and even in a subtle way saying that it's now affecting Trent as well. And we see how Trent's affected when he's fully convinced as the man puts the gun under his chin, saying he has to shoot because he was written that way. So yeah, like I said, even for Trent, reality has changed now. From one weird thing to the next, as Trent gets outside and is confronted by Styles. Does John Trent need to slap a bitch? Uh. Apparently yes. Trent gets Styles in the car and tries to drive, but she has his keys, which she promptly swallows, which was no easy feat. And then he just hits her again. Seemed a little unnecessary to me. Trent improvises with a screwdriver to get the car working and quickly drives out of town. Styles wakes up and starts trying to kiss Trent again, saying it's because it's good for the book. Not much of an editor if she thinks that and she forces Trent to stop the car and he gets out, seeing the old man boy with the bike. Then Styles gets out of the car too, doing a creepy spider walk. Oh, 
<laughs> That's a really effective use of a contortionist actress, practical effects, and just hideous bone crunching sound effects. It's a really good effect. On top of the fact that Styles, who's the cane expert and Trent's helper, now she's all messed up, it really hammers home Trent's dire situation. And on that note, Trent knows to drive off, leaving Styles in the road, because when somebody twists their head round, they lose their carpooling privileges, frankly. However, Trent finds that he's unable to leave the town like the guy on the bike, as he keeps appearing back in the town centre in front of the mob. So eventually, in this nightmare Groundhog Day, like most of us would, Trent drives straight through them. But Styles appears in front of the car, causing Trent to swerve off the road and is knocked unconscious. And now we get to the nitty gritty of what's going on, as Trent wakes up trapped in a confessional, and a white light comes from the other stall. Which, considering Trent's about to be confronted by the reality of the situation, the symbolism is almost out of control. And then Sutter Kane starts talking with Trent. Kane talks about the nature of belief, in honestly the most interesting aspect of the film, arguing that more people have read his work than have read the Bible. They believe his work more than any religion before it, thus making it real. However, I do have a problem with that idea, because belief is a lot different to just reading something. Because let's be honest, I doubt many people who read Stephen King actually think his books are real events. But I do get the idea, and I like how the film gives power to the written word. It's not just a movie about horror, but it's also a love letter to books, albeit in a pretty horrific shell. Kane's ego is now literally godlike, as he continues talking about his book and how every new reader gives it power through belief. And the more people who read it, the faster things will go to hell. Which is a bit of a waste of Kane's godlike power, only to destroy the world immediately after getting them. Then Kane appears next to Trent to show him the book. Well, he says that, but all he does is slam his head into the wall, which gives Trent the same vision Style saw. Trent appears in Kane's hell study, and he gives Trent the book to take back to the world, saying that it's what he wrote him to do. You are what I write. Like this town. It wasn't here before I wrote it. And neither were you. Trent doesn't believe Kane, but Kane reminds Trent about his agent attacking him. He did that because he read about him in the book trying to stop him. The idea that Trent was created by Kane is an interesting one, because as far as we're concerned, Trent has only existed for as long as the movie has been on. You know, that's Trent's whole life right there, barely a hundred minutes in our time. And the concept is a pretty unsettling one too. It's like the philosophy of Last Thursdayism, the idea of everything you know and are was created last Thursday. Because honestly, how would you know? Kane, confident of his control of Trent, tells him to go back as he's staying in his realm. He says he can't hold back whatever's behind the door any longer, and in one of the best ideas of the film, Kane tears himself in half like paper, which opens the door looking like a torn page. Trent looks in the hole and Styles reads from the book everything that's happening, which again is lines taken directly from a Lovecraft story, The Rats in the Walls. And then the creatures start coming through the hole. Trent tries to get Styles to follow, but she chooses to stay as well, and Trent's forced to run. Those monsters are simply fantastic, but it is kind of a shame that we don't get to see more of them. The monsters are a combination of animatronics, guys in suits, and a literal wall of creatures, requiring 40 people to operate. It's an incredibly detailed thing, but we do get to see just enough of them to scare us and appeal to our imagination. Suddenly, Trent appears in the real world like nothing happened. However, he's still holding onto the book, which he promptly drops to the ground. A kid on a bike rides past, a different one to the old guy, and Trent asks him which way to the highway, giving him directions. Before leaving, Trent asks if he's ever heard of Hobbs End, but of course he hasn't. Even when Trent accepts the weirdness, reality just keeps shifting on him. Trent got himself a hotel room, still pretty freaked out by the whole thing. The receptionist hands him a package, surprising Trent, and in his room he finds it's the manuscript, which he decides to promptly burn, but naturally it won't be that easy. The next day, Trent is taking a bus back to the city, being annoyed by a talkative old woman next to him. That night, Trent wakes up to find Cain next to him, proclaiming himself as God, and he gives Trent proof of his godliness. I'm not going anywhere. I'm God now, you understand? God's not supposed to be a hack horror writer. But maybe 
I can help you believe. Look around when you wake up. Did I ever tell you my favorite color was blue? Well, I think that's a reasonable response, given the situation. But this brings me back to when I mentioned Kane's agent's eyes, because they were also blue, giving even more, if indeed you need any more, credence to Kane's claim of omnipotence. Back in the city, Trent has told the whole story to Harglow. He doesn't believe him, but Trent insists it happened, and he's not crazy. He mentions Styles, but Harglow doesn't remember her. Trent says that's because she was written out by Kane. However, when Trent says he destroyed the book, Harglow's quick to point out that can't be true, because Trent gave him the book months ago and the book has been in stores for weeks, horrifying Trent when Harglow says the movie will be out next month. This is one of the parts of the movie that doesn't really make much sense to me, because Trent didn't deliver the book, or at least has no memory of doing that. So why did he need to bring it in the first place? Again, you could argue it's because it needs to flow like a story, but at this point, does it really matter considering that Kane is God? And outside a bookstore which is heaving with Sutter Kane worshippers, someone comes out reading In the Mouth of Madness, with the prerequisite bleeding blue eyes. And Trent kills the guy, becoming the axe-wielding maniac now, showing the extent of his descent into madness. And now we know why he's in the nut house, as we shift back to the present. After hearing Trent's story, the guy leaves and Trent says things will get worse out there and it's safer in his cell now. The guy speaks with the doctor, telling him that Trent's story was useless, and then we get the very last really spoken line of the film. Do you read such a game? Which I think says a lot, really. Trent, in his cell, hears chaos and screaming all around as he sees struggling outside, but it suddenly stops. The silence is broken by some unknown creature clawing at the door, however at daybreak Trent finds he's unharmed and the cell door slashed and open. Trent makes his way outside with the hospital completely deserted, but not just that, the whole city seems to be deserted, in full zombie apocalypse style. But as long as there's no Miliovovich, I'm perfectly fine with it. Trent's walking down the street, and there are people in the background I should mention, but their swaying back and forth makes me doubt that they would be particularly useful and Trent comes to a theatre showing In the Mouth of Madness, with the poster actually saying starring John Trent and Linda Stiles. So Trent decides to watch the film, which turns out to be the very same film we have just sat through. And like any true Lovecraft movie, Trent laughs through the madness as we cut to credits. <laughs> And even the credits have some nice touches too, like how Trent, Styles, and Harglow don't appear in the end credits. But also, you know that bit that says no animals were harmed in the making of this film? Well, it's slightly changed to as follows. Animal interaction was monitored by the American Humane Association, with on-set supervision by the Toronto Humane Society. No animals were harmed in the making of this film. All fine so far. But then... Human interaction was monitored by the Interplanetary Psychiatric Association. The body count was high, the casualties heavy. Quite the way to end the film there. I like it. So that was In the Mouth of Madness. And it's arguably one of the best Lovecraft movies out there. Obviously not being based on any Lovecraft story, it's not a true Lovecraft film. But it's definitely John Carpenter's own contribution to the Cthulhu mythos. And it does it masterfully well. Lovecraft stories sometimes use the technology and knowledge of the time and turn them into something horrific. And that's exactly what Carpenter did here. Taking something as simple as a book or a film and saying, what if what we read or watched was watching back? And it's amazing. The acting from everyone is fantastic, with Sam Neill playing a character who quite literally goes insane over the course of the film. No easy feat, but he's convincing throughout. And although he's not in the film much, Jürgen Prochnow is a great villain, and his presence is felt throughout. In the Mouth of Madness is by far my favourite horror movie of all time, and a real love letter to H.P. Lovecraft. So really, it was the perfect way to end this month. But you know what? All this talk about Lovecraft and the negativity surrounding it, I decided to prove the stories wrong, because I went to Innsmouth. Yes, I did. And you know what? I found the place perfectly lovely. I didn't see a single thing... 
Uh-oh.